Chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or CLL, is a blood cancer, and the type of cancer is in its name. It is a cancer involving chronic or mature cells that are lymphocytic or lymphocytes, and leukemia essentially just means the prefix white, and emia, the suffix emia, means an abnormal condition of the blood, so it's an abnormal condition of white blood, but it's specifically a blood cancer. In this lesson, we're going to discuss in detail the epidemiology, signs and symptoms, diagnosis and staging, and treatment of CLL. So again, CLL is a blood cancer involving mature lymphocytes, but more specifically, it is a mature B-cell neoplasm involving monoclonal B-cells that progressively accumulate over time. Typically, it is an incidental finding, something just, just is picked up on a routine CBC. So if we were to see a CBC, we see increased white blood cell count, and we see under a blood smear that these are mature white blood cells, and more specifically, they are mature lymphocytes, this leads us to the possibility that this is a CLL diagnosis. And you can see in this peripheral blood smear here, these mature lymphocytes. Now, CLL is considered the same condition as non-Hodgkin lymphoma, small lymphocytic lymphoma, or SLL. But this condition, the non-Hodgkin lymphoma, small lymphocytic lymphoma, is considered when lymph nodes are involved. And we consider the condition CLL when only the blood is involved. So that's the main difference. They're considered the same cancer, but CLL is when the blood is involved and, and the non-Hodgkin lymphoma, small lymphocytic lymphoma is when the lymph nodes are involved and less so the blood. Now, what is the epidemiology and other risk factors of CLL? CLL is the most common adult leukemia in Western countries. It has a propensity more for males than females, but generally not a huge difference. The male to female ratio is 1.3 to 1.7 to 1. Now, this is considered an, a cancer of older age. The median age of diagnosis is generally 70 years old. And the incidence of CLL increases as we age. This condition seems to be more common in Caucasians. And there are no really proven causes. There may be some uh, associations with benzene exposure, other types of exposure, but really nothing has been proven as of yet. And there may be some genetic component with regards to CLL. So if there's a family history of CLL, it may increase the risk of having CLL in later generations. But I'm not going to discuss it too much here because a lot of the genetics involved is still in study. So what is the clinical presentation of CLL? We discussed the blood findings, but what are some of the physical findings of CLL? The most common physical finding is actually lymphadenopathy and occurs in about 50 to 90% of cases. And generally speaking, it is cervical, axillary or under the armpits and supraclavicular lymph nodes or above the clavicle. So you can see in this image some lymph nodes here. And the lymph nodes are usually described as firm, non-tender and mobile. So you might be thinking, well, you just said that lymph nodes are involved in the SLL, the non-Hodgkin small lymphocytic lymphoma. Well, again, CLL, there's going to be characteristic findings in the blood. It's more of a blood cancer, but you can still see the lymphadenopathy. So again, they're considered the same, but they are still distinguished. And we're going to discuss how we distinguish them a little bit later. The next most common physical finding is splenomegaly, and it occurs in about 25 to 55% of cases. So it's essentially an enlargement of the spleen. And because you get an enlargement of the spleen, it begins to push up against other structures in the same area, and more specifically, it is the stomach, which causes early satiety, and you can get left upper quadrant pain as well. When you do palpate the spleen, it is generally painless and non-tender. The third most common physical finding is hepatomegaly, and this occurs in 15 to 25% of cases. So you can see here it's an enlargement of the liver, but if you were to palpate the liver on physical examination, it is non-tender. And other symptoms that are less likely to occur in CLL are the constitutional symptoms. These occur in over 5 to 10% of cases. Constitutional symptoms are, again, unintentional weight loss greater than 10% within the past six months, Fevers that are greater than 100.5 Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius for greater than two weeks without known infection, and drenching night sweats. So those are the constitutional symptoms. You might also have extreme fatigue as well. So again, not as common as in other cancers, but you can see constitutional symptoms in CLL. Some other less common findings on physical examination 
involve the skin. You may get leukemia cutis. Leukemia cutis can involve the face and basically anywhere on the body, the face most specifically. It is macules, papules, ulcers, blisters. So you can see here in this image, this is leukemia cutis. Essentially, the white blood cells begin to infiltrate the skin and cause these maculopapular type lesions and can cause ulcers and blisters. And patients may also describe exaggerated reaction to insect bites, most specifically mosquito bites. So they may have a mosquito bite. That mosquito bite area may become more swollen, have discharge, or maybe more pus from that area due to the increased levels of white blood cells. There can also be renal involvement. The renal involvement can lead to membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis or minimal change disease. And there can also be hyperviscosity syndrome. White blood cells become so high, the levels become so high, the blood gets so thick because of so many white blood cells that it essentially becomes hyperviscous and it can lead to headaches. And even in some cases, if white blood cells become even more elevated in very high levels, you can even get uh, transient ischemic attacks and strokes. And again, typically speaking, the lymphocyte count has to be usually greater than 250 times 10 to the 9th per liter. So again, it's important to rule out hyperviscosity syndrome when you see patients with CLL. So always ask about headaches, always ask about maybe symptoms of TIAs. Some other findings, more on blood work includes anemia and anemia can lead to a variety of symptoms as well. Fatigue, pallor, shortness of breath, dyspnea on exertion. You may see neutropenia. You can have recurrent and prolonged infections due to the neutropenia. You may also see thrombocytopenia, which can increase the risk for gingival bleeding, easy bruising and bleeding, hematuri, hematochesia, melina, and epistaxis. So generally speaking, what happens is the mature B cells essentially crowd out other types of cells and lead to drops in the other types of cells. And you'll see this in more aggressive types of CLL. So how do we diagnose and how do we stage CLL? Diagnosis involves flow cytometry. And generally speaking, we need to see an absolute B lymphocyte count of greater than 5,000 per microliter. So greater than 5 times 10 to the 9th per liter of these monoclonal B cells. And the monoclonal B cells themselves are going to be positive for CD5, CD19, CD20, and CD23. For SLL, the other non-Hodgkin small lymphocytic lymphoma, we have to have lymph node involvement and we have to have less than 5 times 10 to the 9th per liter. This is how we essentially distinguish these two conditions. They're essentially the same condition, but with the blood count and lymph node involvement, this is how we can distinguish them on diagnosis. So what if you have high B lymphocyte count, but no lymph node involvement, but it doesn't quite fit this threshold. So it has no lymph node involvement and it's less than 5,000 microliters. Maybe it could be 4,900. It, it's pretty close, but it's not quite at our threshold. Well, we would actually call that a monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis. So it's almost like a precancer. And what happens is, generally speaking, they could transform into a CLL. So once they hit this threshold of greater than 5,000 cells or they have lymph node involvement, then we can classify them as a cancer. But until then, it is not. So just to go over this one more time, CLL and non-Hodgkin small lymphocytic lymphoma are considered the same condition. CLL is when we have greater than 5,000 B lymphocytes per microliter. So that is the threshold for the diagnosis. If we have that, even if we have lymph node involvement, this is still considered CLL. For SLL, we have to have less than 5,000 cells per microliter. And we have to have lymph node involvement. So for SLL, we need lymph node involvement and we have to have less than 5,000 cells. For CLL, we need greater than 5,000 cells and we can have plus or minus lymph node involvement. So how do we stage CLL? We use the modified Rye clinical scoring system. There are stages zero to stage four. Stage zero is lymphocytosis in the blood and bone marrow and there's nothing else. Stage 1 is lymphocytosis plus enlarged lymph nodes or lymphadenopathy. Stage 2 is lymphocytosis in an enlarged liver or spleen plus or minus lymphadenopathy. Stage 3 is lymphocytosis plus anemia plus or minus hepatosplenomegaly or lymphadenopathy. And stage 4 is lymphocytosis plus thrombocytopenia plus or minus anemia, hepatosplenomegaly or lymphadenopathy. So the more severe the stage, 
generally speaking, other cell types will become involved in the higher stages. So you get lymph nodes involved first, then maybe the spleen and liver, and then you start to see the other cell types getting involved later. Anemia and then thrombocytopenia would be the latest or the highest stage. We can also use what we call the Binet staging system as well. I won't get into that here, but you can look that up for other reference. So what can we do to treat CLL and what is the prognosis? So this is going to be a good board exam question. For CLL, generally speaking, if the patient is asymptomatic, it is a watch and wait approach. So we do nothing. So we essentially just keep following the patient to see if they start to have any of those physical findings we talked about earlier, to see if they have any other changes in blood counts, like we talked about anemia and thrombocytopenia. If they don't have any of those things, we don't do anything. Because what has been found is that some untreated patients, when they simply have an elevated lymphocyte count, is that they will have survival rates similar to the general population, even when they're untreated. So essentially, we don't want to expose them to the risks and side effects of chemotherapy. So we don't do anything. But if patients do become symptomatic, say in a later follow-up, they develop constitutional symptoms, we need to treat them at that time. And the treatment involves looking at the genetics of the CLL cancer. If there is a 17P deletion or a TP53 mutation, we use a brutinib and we add rituximab if it's a younger aged patient. If there's no 17P deletion or TP53 mutation, we have to do a bit more investigative work. We look at IGHV, if it, that is a mutation negative. We use the same treatment as we did over here, a brutinib, and we add rituximab for younger age patients. If it is an IGHV mutation positive, we use FCR, fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab. What has been recently found and what is interesting is that for symptomatic and even asymptomatic watch and wait approach patients, we can add and give them vitamin D and calcium supplements because these have actually been shown to reduce the progression of CLL. So again, give them vitamin D and calcium supplements because this has actually been shown to reduce the progression of CLL. So what's the prognosis for CLL? Generally speaking, if it's an asymptomatic early stage, the median survival is 10 years or more. The progressive disease, maybe with some of these other uh, lymphadenopathy, constitutional symptoms, some of the other findings we talked about earlier with thrombocytopenia and anemia, the progressive diseases can have a medium survival of 18 months to three years. So what I really want you to take away from this slide is that if you're asked about treatment for CLL on a board exam, it's most likely a do no harm question. Asymptomatic patients only need a watch and wait approach. We don't need to do anything because a lot of times the survival rates are similar to the general population and a lot of times these patients are older and they will die with CLL and not from it. So again, it's a do no harm type of situation. But if they do become symptomatic, we want to treat with the brief algorithm we talked about here. And again, can always add vitamin D and calcium supplements because these have been shown to reduce progression of CLL. If you want to learn more about other types of blood cancers, please check out my other hematology lessons. And if you haven't done so already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.